Welcome everyone. I'm going to get us started. For those of you I haven't met, I'm Jerry Warzenek and I'm the Director of Regional and Shared Interest Engagement in the Office of Alumni Relations at Tufts. Thanks to everyone for joining us for our final event of Global Tufts Month. As some of you might know, Global Tufts Month has been running throughout March with all kinds of activities on this year's theme of global perspectives on diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. So I hope that you had a chance to tune into the other great discussions hosted by our international alumni chapters this month. And if you've missed any, uh, you'll be able to find the recordings on our Tufts alumni YouTube channel, as well as this one soon. So we'll put a link in the chat later. A um, Couple quick Zoom notes, just stay on mute during the talk so we don't have any background noise. We will have probably about half of today's time for Q&A. So this is meant to be really interactive. Feel free to ask questions in the chat at any time. I'll keep an eye on it. And then once we get to Q&A, feel free to just unmute yourself and, and ask your question. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our fantastic Tufts faculty speakers. We have with us Nina Gerasi Navarro, who's a professor of Latin American literature and culture in the Romance Studies Department and also the Director of Latin American Studies. And also with us is Colin Oriens, who is a Professor of Biology and Director of Environmental Studies. I'm gonna hand it over to them to tell you more about themselves and give you a flavor of their interdisciplinary course, Sustaining Your Drink, which is the subject of tonight's event, as you all know. So Nina and Colin, over to you. Thank you. I'm not on mute, so good. Welcome everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm in the Romance Studies Department and I teach a range of courses from introductory um, courses on Latin American literature uh, to courses on film, um, outlaws, the Latin American city. I generally focus my courses on topics. Um, but my research is mainly on 19th century. Um, I've worked on nation building and the role that women have played in that process, especially um, outlaws and um, travel narratives. And I recently published a book that had to do with um, women travelers and the way they observe. And it was really close to one of those was a scientist. And that's kind of the segue that I've, my interest has continued into the relationship between literature and science. And I think that's how I connected to Colin, um, whom I've known because we've been in different committees together. But then um, one of the scientists that I'm looking at um, was Aimé Bonplan, who traveled with Humboldt in the 19th century to discover um, Latin America and never went back. He actually returned to Europe, came back to, went to Argentina and Paraguay and never went back. And so, um, and he, he started working on investigating and actually producing mate. And that connection is, I had some questions about mate and tea and that led me to talk to Colin about um, what he knew about, about that kind of production. And I knew he worked in Costa Rica and he'll get to introduce himself, but that's how kind of by these sort of chance encounters and conversations, we got to build something much larger, which is this course that we'll talk about in a second. Colin. Well, it's, it's uh, great to join you. I, as, as I, as you heard, I'm in the biology department. I actually did my graduate training and all my graduate research in Costa Rica. I have been interested in tropical ecology for a long time. And uh, starting around 2001, I started teaching a tropical ecology and con um, conservation class. And I would take students to Costa Rica as part of that class and really try to give them a sense of what does it mean to think about tropical forests and, and the conservation and the ecology of those systems. And I've been doing that class every other year for a long time. My research has taken me all over. Uh, I've worked on the sort of in, impacts of climate on the quality of tea. And I was thinking about how could I get my research, not just my teaching back to Costa Rica. So then I started a few years back to sort of think about how um, coffee farmers are responding to the various threats that they face. 
And when COVID-19 hit, I was, um, I was thinking, oh my gosh, you know, all my research in Costa Rica is, is coming to a, a, a halt. How am I going to stay involved? And is there some way of sort of bringing my research to the students virtually? And so that was part of the trigger for this class was to, was to think about how can we um, bring the lives of farmers, the lives of academics, the lives of people in the industry to our students and how can we connect our students to other students. The last thing I'll just say is that I've been director of the environmental studies program now, now since 2010. And one of the things that's just really, really clear as we think about solutions to sort of global challenges is you can't do it as a biologist. Uh, you can't really do it as a sociologist. You can't do it just as any one discipline. You really have to be interdisciplinary. So I've always had this sort of like sense of, I want to connect to other faculty and I want to think about ways in which together we can make a bigger difference than either one of us could from our own disciplinary perspectives. And so I think that's why when the Guild opportunity came forward, um, my immediate reaction was to try to connect to a colleague in, in a different discipline and say, let's do this. And, and Nina had, and I had had a conversation about Mate uh, maybe a year and a half before and out on the lawn as we were thinking about sort of like our mutual interests in the ecology and the cultures of things that we drink. So that's, that's what we got, that's what brought us together. And then I would continue to say that as we thought about the course, um, instead of, you know, there's this traditional divide between the sciences and the humanities. And what we really wanted to do is bridge that in an international way um, with, with our interests, but in a, a meaningful way for our students. So that, um, and, and I always give credit to, to Colin because, he really cares about how do you communicate? How do you tell the story um, and, uh, 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 of what, what is important and why it is important? And so as we thought about this, we found that we could actually work together and, and, and think about um, uh, ways in which um, we could help teach our students to tell the story about either mate or wine or coffee, which is what we ended up um, choosing, and to choose a relevant aspect and to bind together um, storytelling, if you want to put it in a simple way, and science. And so Colin, you know, really emphasized this. And, and so we started really by, by finding um, some short literature pieces that have to do with science. And I have to say, um, I had my own stereotypes of do scientists really get the pleasure of, of stories and things like that. And, 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 and I was pleasantly surprised by the response of the students to the text that I chose and how they engaged and how they could connect it to science. Um, and I think that was a, a, one of the main things we learned in this course. I mean, I think for, for both of us, but definitely for me, is that until you start working together, you have ideas of what another discipline does or is, but you really don't know until you really have to tackle it. Um, and I think that was one of the exciting things about this course. And, and so, so our goal was to sort of create a virtual study abroad, right? Our students were stuck. Um, they were stuck in their rooms, uh, maybe in their dorms. Um, how, how do you do that? And, and I was reflecting on my own study abroad experience as a student and I'm thinking very often you go abroad and you still hang out with other people from your university and you still don't get that full immersion. Maybe you get to do a homestay, in which case it's much more immersive, but. So we were trying to do the next best thing, which was bring students from Costa Rica, Argentina, and Chile into the course and, and really have them be part of the course. They weren't students and like having to do all the assignments and the homework because they had their own things, but we did have them work on a group project that lasted the, the course of the semester. 
And they did it in English, but they often, they were encouraged to create another version in, in, um, in Spanish. So we ended up with uh, 16 students 16. From, Coast, uh, from Tufts, a couple from Costa Rica. I, I wanna say that we had maybe another 14 or 15 at the end from Argentina and, an, and, a, um, and another 10 or so from Chile. So we ended up, whatever the number is, we ended up with teams of three um, working together, Tufts and non tough students working together, creating a, a story map that would combine the culture and the science around su the sustainability of coffee, mate. And I wanted to do tea initially because I actually have done research on tea, but we realized tea really isn't part of the Latin American experience, but wine is. So, so we, we um, and it's certainly, our connections in Chile to, to the wine industry were really strong thanks to Nina's work with the Tufts in Chile program. And, and so Nina connected us to, to colleagues in Argentina and Chile, and I connected us to colleagues in Costa Rica. And, and together we pulled together uh, students from, from those countries to be part of the class. And we had a very eclectic group. We had um, the students from Argentina were generally um, from studying communications. So they had a more visual um, uh, 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 eye. Um, and the students in um, uh, the students in Chile were much more focused on wine and were actually either um, studying the production of wine or had or worked on small farms, um, uh, wine producers. So, so, and then the, the, the students from Costa Rica were all connected to coffee. So um, we, we, we had different levels of language and we had different interests. And the point, the difficult part for the students uh, um, was to really negotiate um, their different interests and talents and construct something together. Um, we also organized a um, coffee hour with one of, uh, uh, with a student um, that was separate from the class where all the students could come and connect and talk. And that I think was really useful. What we found was that if you give different people with different talents and even expectations, a project, they will come together and figure it out um, and will learn how to work together. Um, it's much easier than just sit and have a conversation. But at the same time, when they had that coffee hour that was led by a student who had studied in Argentina and spoke Spanish and English, um, she was able to create a different space where after working together, the students could kind of get to know each other, which I think worked really well. Um, I don't know if you've seen what the story maps look like. So Jabari, if you could give me sharing um, privileges or Jerry, I could pull a couple of them up. Excellent, thank you. So one of them was called Flowery Wine, the Blossoming Path to an Organic and Sustainable Drink. And you can see, so Maddie Allen was the tough student. Uh, Noelia was from Argentina. Fabian, I think was from Chile. Um, from Chile. Um, and Javi was from Argentina, I believe. Um, and so they created this incredibly, um, aesthetically pleasing story map. And so you, you, in, the do, in doing this, you have sort of like they themed it around the different plants that you might put around your, your wineries and, and sort of let, let the sort of the activity of the story map sort of pull you into this idea that wine can be more than just grapes. Um, and, and it can be, you know, and, and flowers are more than just things that you put on your, your windowsill. And, and so they, they, they sort of pull, I think they do a beautiful job of sort of pulling you in to wanting to learn more in a really simple, but really compelling way. Um, 
and so then they sort of introduce you to to the wine system and um and why there's a challenge where you you just mow and get rid of all the soil and so but what if you could do some cover cropping and make make the areas between the wines a much more lush uh, inviting space that's good for good for different sort of plant species good for pollinators that would also actually provide maybe a quality to the wine that you weren't expecting and so you know this got them into the science of sort of the chemistry of flowering and the volatiles that get absorbed by the grapes um, trying to eliminate pesticide use um, within the, the farms that also contribute to sort of a better sort of better wine and so they they sort of transitioned from topic to topic as they changed the slides. Um, and Nina, go ahead and throw some other thoughts you might have in there as I scroll slow, slowly through. What's interesting is that the students were also surprised, right? So they, we had them do um, response papers or response uh, um, um, short responses at the end of the week. And, and it was really a, a pleasure to see how much they were uncovering and how doing this project on um, Chile, for example, they were surprised some by what the Chileans knew. Um, and, but at the same time, think about what they could do here in the US, right? So, um, and that was the idea of creating this, this bridge. It is, I think they also had fun doing this, um, these projects. They're quite, yeah, they quite do. beautiful. And I think the communications students played a lot with the filming, right? And the little clips. And we had help from, um, from um, the, what, the, design, the, the libra librarians who helped the students and gave a tutorial about how to create a story map because there are many, many steps. Um, so this was really important. Um, and um, Kim Ferreiro Arnias and Alan Gamble. Alan Gamble uh, were very important resources um, because they knew a lot and then they worked with the students separately outside of the class. So there was a lot of work outside of the class. Um, which was the opportunity that they had to really have to find a schedule and, and plan um, and really immerse themselves in communicating. You should note that, um, or I should note that not all students had the same language capacity and sometimes that was difficult and we had to help out. But um, for the most part, they managed and they managed also to speak with people outside outside of academia. It's really pretty. Yeah. And so you'll if you if you've been watching as I've been scrolling through, so chamomile is really about sort of pest control, attracting predators. It's about its own volatiles that might be emitted. Dandelions are about sort of preserving the soil. Clovers and sweet peas. Are about getting nitrogen into the system because they're both legumes, which means that they can take atmospheric nitrogen and fixate, fix it with their mutualistic rhizobia. And all of a sudden you've got organic nitrogen available to the plants. And so they're going through the science. And but I don't think you even know you're learning the science as you as you're watching this. You 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 have this opportunity to learn an awful lot of science. But I think that what struck me when I first watched it was how much I wanted to have wine from a, a, an integrated, you know, cover cropping system. And so now I find myself going to wineries and thinking about, you know, can I get, can I get wines that are organic? Can I get them that, that say that they've grown them with cover cropping? How do I find that information out? And then this, this last site, Roses, they're actually using as sort of like the canary in the mine, which is that you can you can use it as an indication of how well you, you're treating your your grape plants because they're early indicators of a winery under stress. Um, so, 
And another thing, um, the course also incorporated uh, guest lecturers as well as practitioners. So this idea of going out and sort of immersing yourself in another culture, we had um, wine producers talk um, and we had mate growers um, also give, give a talk as well as academics. So they could see the difference between, between the two and ask different kinds of questions. And then afterwards, when all the students started working on their projects, they reached out to several of the speakers we had had because now they had much more, many more concrete questions um, that were relevant and pertinent to their projects. You know, another group, I'll, I'll just show quickly, you know, they did yeah. a really different approach to it. So they, this was one on Mate, uh, mates for mate, which is kind of the same general idea. You don't, you know, a sustainable mate system is not a system where you grow mate by itself in large monocultures. It's really a, an idea that you can do what's more considered integrated farming, bringing plants together that are complementary. And so they, it, these three, um, really began to get us thinking about how are some farmers in Argentina and in Misiones region, um, which is one of the poorest regions of Argentina actually, but they're trying to do mate production in a way that is better for, um, for the production system. And so they talk about some of the challenges of really intensive farming and the soil erosion that happens with that and um, the deforestation pressures in the system and then after all of that, then they bring us to sort of, let's introduce agroforestry and they embedded a clip on agroforestry that you could watch if you wanted to go back to these. I would be happy to share the, um, the links with you in the yeah. chat as we finished. Um, then they did their own sort of animation with this and built up some, some things that you could watch on your own. And they took a lot of pride in sort of the product that they were creating um, as you went through, creating some of their own graphics to sort of highlight what forestry does in an integrated system. And uh, uh, what else do I wanna say here? So, and then there was a call to action and, and sort of what you could do and the steps you would take to create an agroforestry system. And this group included, you know, titles in Spanish um, at the, uh, when they gave, the students had to give their presentation and they started with a brief summary in Spanish um, that, that, that uh, one of their um, teammates, generally the Spanish speaking um, teammate uh, um, did. But then, um, some have, especially in Mate, because there was uh, um, two students that really wanted to work, continue working on translating their, their complete um, story map to Spanish. So that, that connection was really, I mean, it, it went further than what needed to be for the class, which is always gratifying. Yeah. So I can, I, I'd be happy to leave these up if anybody has any, if they wanna go back to either of these stories or I could tell you about some of the others. Um, I could also stop sharing the screen if we wanna have more of a, a general chat about some of the, the objectives of the course or the, the story map students made. I think that might be good. That second option, if you put the link that Okay, I'll do that. And then. I'm trying to stop share. Jose has already a question. Thank you. Jose. Hello. How are you? Hi. Um, 
I'm, I'm very curious. I mean, it's very interesting. Um, basically, I have two, two questions. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes, fine. Um, the first question is, um, in particular for the Tufts undergraduates, how, I mean, obviously, back, back uh, in my day, uh, the possibility of being able to do a combined, um, you know, this, this, this combination of, of science and, 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 and literature um, um, was not something uh, that didn't exist. I mean, this is something, not, I wouldn't say new, but relatively new. Um, how, how does this count for the undergraduate student? I mean, is this, is there a, a, within the curriculum, the general curriculum that they have to do, they have the opportunity to be able to, um, to take courses of this type? That was the first question. And the second, um, I know that you've, you've done this, and in particular, being able to draw in students from uh, uh, Costa Rica and Chile and, and Argentina um, is making the most of of this situation of the pandemic, and is this something that you're you're thinking of being able to repeat? And what what were the biggest issues uh, or problems that that you had? I mean, um, you mentioned I think something about language may, maybe being a, a, a an issue, but um, one was just you know where does this come in within the uh, the general curriculum? Uh, because uh, is this somebody who's doing a major in in biology? How does this sort of like fit into to what they're doing or somebody who's studying, uh, you know, Latin American literature, how does this sort of fit in? Super so fascinating, I'll, by the way. Yeah. So I'll start with that. How does it count at least? Um, so for um, Latin American studies, um, it's the focus is really on culture. So, and we have as the program is always it's interdisciplinary so you have to have certain we want a variety of courses and in recent years I'm going to extend this a little bit as students for example went study went to study abroad in Chile and they took um, marine biology um, we used to never count those courses and I thought why not because if it's a specific about Latin America why shouldn't that be able uh, uh, to count um, one thing is marine biology in general, but if you're looking at the specifics within the coast of Chile, so we, we, we have begun to sort of open that uh, um, and incorporate um, more science classes, and this would fit under that. Also, in the Spanish department or the Spanish program, um, there are always electives. And so the, um, this actually, although it's, uh, uh, and there's an elective that can also count if it deals with Latin America or Spain, if it's in English. So within those electives, this is the kind of course that really takes the student out of the traditional curriculum. And it, it allows to student, the student to explore, which is what we want them to do. And I think it counts the same for, for science. I'll let you answer that part, Colin. I mean, certainly within environmental studies, students could, could use this class as, as an elective. Um, I think that there are a certain distribution requirements that students need that they could, uh, we had one student who, who really um, wanted a science credit at, um, for his graduation and uh, thought really hard about whether or not it was going to have a sufficient science to sort of al allow for that. And we decided that we were going to be diving into the science. But I, I think one of the surprises that we had is that we ended up taking a couple first year students. And when you first come to, and, and they were like some of the best and most engaged students. And so I think we surprised ourselves with this idea that you could take a first year student, expose them to a cross cultural. Um, exploration of a topic like sustainability, um, working with students abroad. And I have a feeling it changes their trajectory. And a lot of times I, as an advisor, I tell students, take a whole bunch of different classes your first semester, 
and so they can help you define where you want to go. And so, you know, you might take this class and say, I really want to do more biology or I really want to do more sort of cultural studies. Uh, so I think what we hoped is that, you know, we had students who were seniors and we had students that were freshmen and they each got something different out of the class. Um, but I, I guess the, uh, yeah, I would just say that many students finish their majors by their junior year. So they have a, a fair bit of bandwidth to sort of explore some classes along the way. And, and I, I know that in the, in COVID times, having a class that was a little bit out of the box was something that appealed to the students in this class. Yeah. And in terms of the difficulties, well, language, um, language is a difficulty. I wouldn't think it's, uh, um, uh, the main difficulty, um, what you need, there's a, there's a lot of, I guess another difficulty is the synchronization. Semesters don't always start at the same time. In Chile, they certainly didn't start at the same time. So you had to plan really carefully when to incorporate the students, um, the structure, the times. We had a time change, which those are little things, but complicate how the student can, the students abroad can access our classes. Um, and I think that it just takes a lot like any course on Zoom, but doubly so when you're doing this kind of course, you need to really work beforehand and, and, and plan very carefully. Um, and it is very helpful to have someone in the country that you're working with to be the go-to person because you are in constant contact. And so the students can contact him or her um, and, and, and which is what we had uh, uh, in, in, in Argentina and Chile, um, which was very useful because that's where we had the bulk of our students and then reach out to us. Otherwise we would be dealing with individual students all the time and that would be time consuming and chaotic because you don't always give the same answers and that's what you need to give structure. So, um, um, and then if you have that kind of structure, you can have students with different interests in those other countries. Like we had all our Argentina students from communications, but maybe we could have had it next time um, from the sciences or from um, communication or from literature um, that, would allow once, you know, the first try, the first time is always a test. Um, and there have been more positives than uh, uh, negatives or difficulties. And the difficulties just enhance the positive once you deal with them. Looks like we have another question in the chat. Sure. Um, so why don't we go to that one first? Um, it says, are sustainable practices like cover crops or multi-crop growing being promoted by big buyers on, or multinational corporations sourcing these products? So I think the answer in coffee is absolutely, right? I think that, you know, there's a whole sustainable coffee, you know, specialty coffee angle. And a lot of that is through like Rainforest Alliance certification, bird-friendly coffee, um, ecological coffee. So, so I think that there's a lot of movement within the large coffee importers to go that direction. Maybe not the really big, maybe not the really big ones. I mean, Coca-Cola imports a lot of coffee. I don't know that they're structuring their buying around these things. In, in wine, I think there's an increasing interest in, in this. Um, and then I would also say in Mate, it has historically not been, but I think that if you go to one of the largest mate producers, they are trying to sell sustainability mate. I mean, you go to their website, it's about, you know, treating the land well, it's about, um, you know, happy faces cu cutting the mate. Uh, so I do think there's a push for it. I don't know if how many people go out or, or, and buying mate because of these kind of um, cover crops or not. But I know that I went, I bought mate this weekend and I made sure to get organic. And I made fun of him and I said, how do you know? Because then there's the other thing, the other issue is that the, the government policies, right? So the local government policies. And so, um, you know, Argentina's 
uh, 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 policies do, do, are not the same as ours or as the Chilean ones for the wine. So that was also interesting for students to discover, right? Uh, um, I think they thought of, okay, Latin America, you know, sort of one big, yeah, yeah, different countries, but there are huge differences between, you know, Chile and, Argent and Argentina right next to each other. The policies policies for pr uh, a production are very, very different, and how those policies influence um, production is is huge. And I think that was very important for them. They couldn't just sort of make a blanket. Um, uh, uh, conception of, of, of how things worked. I, I would actually be kind of curious to know from you whether sustainability practices ever get into your own buying habits. But Tripp, you have a question too, yeah. so. Well, well, maybe I can, this can be a segue. Um, really delighted to be here. Um, I actually uh, am the CEO of a fair trade organic coffee roastery down here in Georgia called Cafe Campesino. Oh. And, we, and we are, well, and it's really interesting. We're part of um, a co-op of uh, 23 other roasters in North America who banded together about 20 years ago to buy coffee, you know, directly re relevant to what is being presented today. Um, uh, Yamila's question about um, focusing our purchase and importation of coffee from small scale farmer co-ops really based on, you know, all elements of sustainability. So, and I, I think Colin, I think you were right that, you know, there are probably smaller, we would be considered a smaller entity, about 150 containers a year, uh, which for us feels humongous, but in the world of coffee is, is not humongous. Um, so with, with that, you know, with that background, one, I think the presentation on the wine and then on the mate, fascinating because what we're finding in our co-op is you have the science of coffee and then you have the humanity of the farmers and the trading relationships. And, and yeah, they, they are deeply intertwined. So um, I really love the program. And if I had, if I was a student today, instead of many moons ago, um, pretty sure I would have clamored to get into this class. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you all. And, uh, but I do have a question too. Um, and I really hope this program continues. Um, what we're seeing, our co-op has an impact committee. And what we do is um, we support, because we buy all of our coffee from small scale farmer co-ops, we support um, through grants, through technical support, through collaboration, the projects, the development projects that these farmer owned co-ops are spearheading their own initiatives, right? You know, farmer led. And what we're finding, especially prior to COVID, but in COVID in particular, um, is food security it is a huge issue. And so, you know, the past several years have really, we've seen a great, um, uh, great movements in terms of advancements in soil science and improving the quality of the soil and moving to um, some self-reliance and ability to um, provide their own food. And my question is, um, I haven't, I did ask, I would love to see the coffee um, stories, um, but is our elements that are, that are, yes, you know, shade grown organic soil for sure, um, but also the human elements weaved into this um, and in particular food security, which just has, I think we had about $120,000 fund that we put together for COVID and well over half of it um, really needed to go to, to food, food security for the co-ops we work with. So, and last thing I'll just say is thank you so much. This is really, this is good stuff. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Next, next time we'll invite you to talk. I think, you know, co-ops were really important. Actually, that's one of the things that students, we all discovered that, that how, how much work can be done from s grouping small, small entities rather than thinking mega. Um, that was very important. I'm I'm kind of talking, hoping Colin, you can bring up one of the the, the coffee because um, I think there was one where students saw touched on this, right? Yeah, I was trying to decide which one to pop open, but I, I will say, you know, it's really interesting. So in in my work in in um, in coffee in Costa Rica, so Costa, and then I've talked to. Uh, I'm assuming you're not sourcing from Costa Rica. 
Um, we used to, we don't anymore. Yeah. So one of the reasons you might not is that, you know, Costa Rican coffee farmers on the relative scale of who's doing well are doing much better than co co coffee farmers in Guatemala and Mexico and, and, and other countries. And so the direct sale, the direct work with cooperatives is going to have a much bigger impact by working with, with coffee farmers. And, and my colleagues in Mexico, they, they say, you know, if we could have the cooperative structure that exists in Costa Rica it would be so much better, but the farmers are, you know, struggling to sort of create that collective empowerment in many of the other countries. And so your work, your work in other countries is probably having a huge impact. It's interesting though, when you look at the coffee farmers in Costa Rica, a lot of them, so a lot of them, their kids go abroad and they, they come up to New Jersey and Connecticut and they, and they learn English and, and then they come back and they don't really want to run the coffee farm like their parents did. And, and they're way more entrepreneurial. And it's really fascinating. A lot of them are trying to do direct sale. They're trying to bypass the co-op. They're saying, you know, I could sell to trip directly and I can create a relationship. And so one of the things we're seeing in the coffee industry is a really fascinating direct sort of farmer to consumer relationship that is, I think, started in coffee and you, I mean, maybe it's been in wine for a long time, but this idea that, you know, you know, you could get, um, you know, coffee from, oh gosh, I'm trying to think of a particular, there's one in, in Santa Maria, Costa Rica that won this national coffee and now they've got a, you know, a gift store, a cafe and, you know, they become like the thing and people want to buy their coffee. Oh yeah, right. Um, so I'm going to pull up one of the, one of the stories, oh, okay. um, and there are, there are others, and, and I will just leave this as a, as an invitation. If you want to know more, I will be happy to share any and all stories with you. Um, in my own work, I've been trying to work a lot with the Specialty Coffee Association, which is this international organization. And we're trying to do supply chain perspectives of how do US consumers have any impact on, if anything, on the sustainability practices of farmers? What is our role? So my research is a collaboration with a agricultural economist at the Friedman School of Nutrition, with myself as a biologist, with a kind of a a policy person at Northeastern who's really interested in how institutions support or don't the sort of the decision-making by farmers. And so we have this really fun interdisciplinary project that this we're trying to build off of in this class. Okay. While you pull the coffee one up, I would say that for Mate, it's the same thing. There's a very big difference between the, the big um, mate producers and the smaller ones and they have to work hard and they can't do the sustainability as well. Oh good. Here it is. So th this one was interesting because they they took an approach that um, where they they actually took us to different countries and some of the efforts that they were doing and so they did more of a comparative analysis of sort of ways in which smallholder farmers in Central and South America are succeeding. It's not as visually stunning as the, the first one we showed you on wine, but it's it's still a really nice, compelling story that that sort of talks about sort of the history of coffee and and um, and what some of some organizations are doing, some really interesting figures. And I think this is kind of an interesting figure because so if you look at Costa Rica, um, it has the average amount of shade, it tends to be light shade. And if you go to Mexico, it's almost all traditionally full shade coffee. And so you get a sense of how coffee growing really differs from country to country in the ways in which people are sort of managing it and growing it and, and how big the typical farm is and how much money they make and, and things like that. So there's sort of a historical context to coffee farming that's really nice in, in this particular story map. Yeah, can I just add one, one really interesting thing? Um, our co-op is working with many of the farmer co-ops in our network 
um, using something called the, the Cool Farm Tool, which is um, being developed to help. I don't know if you've heard of it, Colin uh, or Nina, but it's um, wow. it was a it was a it was an it was a multinational initiative and is being shared with the farmers and being adapted to them so that they can actually start to measure, a, you know, really what really well run organic coffee farm can actually sequester carbon. Uh, oh. There's a really interesting opportunity to potentially monetize that uh, uh, in the purchase of a coffee since we are carbon emitters, they are carbon sequesterers. Yeah. And so there's there's just some really interesting things happening. Um, and, but I really do think it's the, the co-op level is what provides the opportunity with the savvy and the technical support and the management. I, I, I think that would jibe with your experience yeah. as well, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, certainly carbon sequestration is a huge issue and there's farmers are facing a real tension right now with carbon sequestration because um, the, the amount of like labor that goes into a really good sequestering farm is you wanna trim the, you want to trim the plants and you wanna leave all the, 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 the you wanna leave, you wanna go through with a machete and you wanna leave it there and you wanna let things sort of slowly build up and you wanna build up this organic layer Farmers, because they have limited budgets, often go through with weed killer, and so by by using herbicide, you're you're getting rid of any potential for carbon sequestration. So there's a real tension right now, which is, do I spend the money to hire people to do it the right way, and I'm going to sequester more carbon in the process, or do I take the cheap way out, use a weed killer, and just clear everything, which of course puts your farm at risk in the long term. So. But sometimes it's hard to take that long-term perspective when you're just trying to put food on the table for the next year. Seeing a question from Vicky in the chat, um, how can small producers manage to export professionally given the emphasis of shipping in large quantities? Can they export at a reasonable price? That's a that's a great question. So I'm going to let Trip take a first shot at that one. Ah, I, nice I, I mean, done. I don't have an answer, <laughs> but I feel like you have an even better answer. Uh, we can compare notes. I, I would say that's a that's a great question, and that is that's really at the heart of the of what we do. So it's true. Individual coffee farmers really have to sell to local local middle people, right? And small roasters really have to buy from importers. The, totally a key question. The beauty of a, of a co-op is that it allows, you know, 300, 400, 500 farmers to aggregate their supply. You know, you've got to fill a 40, the, the, the unit that you need to fill is a 40,000 pound container. So you get four or 500 pound, four or 500 farmers together and all of a sudden you can fill multiple containers. Well, that's why we did on our roaster side, because individually we can't buy a container from just one coffee, but if we pull our demand, um, we can buy, so for us, we feel like the, a well-organized, a well-run co-op, especially committed to organics and transitional organics, um, answers your question and provides so many other benefits um, to, to the farmers. And it, it, Nina, Colin, does that jive with? Totally, totally. Yeah. There's, there's yeah. the, um, and, and there are organizations in Costa Rica that you know, really help connect farmers to buyers. And, and, and some of the buyers, like here in, in Boston area, there's George Howell and, and George Howell makes specialty coffee. But one of the things they still like to work with these importers, part of the reason they like to work with the importers is that they don't necessarily have the storage capacity. So they'll work with an importer who, who will store it off site for, for quite a while. And then they'll bring it to their, to their, as a green bean. And then, then periodically they could say, give me X amount and then They'll bring it up to Acton and George Howell will do the roasting and getting it just right because you don't want to roast it and have it sit on the shelf for a long time because it spoils and loses all that fragrance that you expect. So there's also a role in which, you know, it's a really complex supply chain. Um, so there is a place for the, the middle importer from, from what I understand, um, just in terms of getting the volume here and getting it stored and then releasing it slowly over time. 
one of the, the, the things that I think stimulated students was that there were problems and we, we addressed the problems and it made them think, well, I can make a difference. Like we can think of ways of tackling these problems. And just because I saw in the chat um, for the um, labor organization, um, someone who works on labor organizing, um, the, the students were really surprised how many children participated, both in uh, coffee production and um, uh, uh, mate. So they had families. And, and so it, it's, it made them think about these issues, like what can we do, even in the United States? It, what is our participation, right? And I think that that's, that's a key component um, when, when you work, which I really like about the sciences, which is you don't give everything solved, but in fact, you expose the problem and look at it from many different angles to try to find a solution. And, and, I, and I just wanna add something about story map that I really love. And I think this, this one's showing it to you, right? So I, you know, I, when I took over environmental studies, I said, you know, you have to be able to communicate and, and not everything is simple. And I used to have students make little short five minute videos on a topic, but the videos are constantly moving and they're going by you and, and your capacity to actually engage in the science or is really limited. And what I've discovered with story maps is that I've just stopped at a page and now you can spend five minutes right here thinking about, okay, so where does Peru fit in the context of the general coffee production from the earlier map? You could actually go through and, and think about, so what's unique about Peru that's different from others? And so if someone wanted to have the science of coffee in Peru, you could actually go into a lot more detail at one particular place within the story map. And so I feel like it gave students the ability to sort of engage in the science in a deeper, more meaningful way, but really visually appealing. And I think you've seen that in some of these. And so I like the story map as a tool. And so that was one of the things that was really exciting about this project was, you know, the, the students in, in Argentina and Chile had never heard of story map before. They didn't have access to it. We were able to make them visiting students for the whole semester, which gave them access to story map and sort of as adjuncts to Tufts University. Um, and, and my other goal as a teacher and is, is to actually connect students to actual projects. And so you could see they were working with real farmers often trying to connect to, to, to organizations that, that really were, were working on the, in this space. I wanted to, um, Vicki Garth has a question about governments in Latin American countries are frequently changing. Um, indeed, and how do those different ideologies um, impact, right, the steady progress in agriculture? And I think, um, I, I think that in this case, globalization can help um, because there are certain demands that are put um, necessarily above uh, local policies um, because it has to do with commerce and production. And so I think that that is um, where we always talk about the pros and cons of globalization. This is an instant that can help, um, especially uh, smaller producers, I think. And the, and the other thing I think some crops are really amenable to doing it in a more sustainable way. I actually think yeah you know, as I've reflected on agriculture in Latin America, coffee, wine, and mate can be done in a, in a sustainable way. And, and, and we have the tools and we, and as we need to sort of connect the consumers with the producers and sort of create that link. Pineapple is a completely different beast. So you go to Costa Rica, Costa Rica is the size of West Virginia. They make, they sell more pineapple than any other country in the world. Okay, this isn't pineapple per acre. This is like total quantity of pineapple in the world being sold. Pineapple production in Costa Rica is not sustainable. There is nothing sustainable about pineapple production. They use a lot of agrochemicals, lots of fertilizer gets in the riverways, causing sort of dead zones off the coast of certain rivers of, um, 
the, the, the amount of fungicides they use, it's having effect on the biodiversity of the area, it's having effect on the worker health. So I think part of our decisions as consumers is, you know, which products do we want to support? So I've stopped buying pineapple, even though I love pineapple, but I've stopped buying pineapple because I just, I look at what it's done to Costa Rica and I just can't do it. We can't end on a sad note, no yeah. buying pineapple. So, so, <laughs> so dragon fruit, you can, you can buy dragon fruit. <laughs> Another thing we did in the course um, is to assign e uh, every two students a different fruit um, to explore. So we, that's, we also learned how terrible pineapple was, but um, uh, for example, passion fruit. And so they would look, they would do a presentation and this actually made them expand and not just focus on the three countries we were working on, um, but expand their, their, their work on um, different fruits and the problems from a sustainable perspective, right? What was happening? Um, so that was important. I'm looking well, that was so much that. fun. We had them do tamarindo and yes. yeah. Uh, happens on. So we should um, put out all the uh, 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 Café Campesinos, the website should go up there, and another organization, Yamila Irizarri um, Gerald's uh, 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 website should go up there, so we all have the information. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I, I think was great fun, my the the this, the woman who who came in and gave a guest lecture from Costa Rica, did her master's thesis on coffee. She teaches agroecology now at the University of Costa Rica, and I wrote to her and I said, "What if we were to teach a course on agroecology in Costa Rica?" She said, "I'd love to." So at some point, post COVID, um, I actually would hope to be able to teach a class in agroecology, and take students along with her and visit coffee farms. She grew up on a coffee farm in Costa Rica. Um, she tells great stories. I can remember several, uh, which, you know, I'm happy to stay on and tell more stories, but, but I know you all have a, um, a finite amount of time, but uh, I, I definitely think that, you know, taking students and being able to see firsthand some of the experiences of farmers, because I always say, it shouldn't be, how are we gonna feed 9 billion people? I, I feel like we should say, how are we gonna support the farmers that are growing the, the food and the beverages that are supporting 9 billion people? And so I, I take a very farmer's perspective on how to support farmers, especially given that most of our food globally is produced by small landholder farmers. Big wheat fields in North America is not the norm. Well said. Great. Well, we are coming up to the hour, so probably should wrap up. Um, but just want to say a huge thank you to our fantastic Tufts professors and for sharing this with the alumni community. I think everyone really enjoyed it. And thanks to everyone for joining. Fortunately, I don't have any more Global Tufts Month events to plug because this is our last one. But what a great closer. Um, and I will, as promised, share that Tufts Alumni YouTube channel link in the chat. Um, for you. There will be a playlist on that with all of our Global Tufts Month events coming shortly, just once they're all captioned. So keep an eye out for that. Um, Thank you. Can I just add something to Jose's um, a, a comment and question? Of course. And, uh, yes, Mate is, uh, as we know, well, uh, a shared uh, active uh, drinking Mate is a shared activity, even though under COVID, everyone began having their own Mate. We provided with the funds that Guild gave us um, a gourd and some mate and a bombilla, the metal straw for each student. And during the coffee hour, they learned how to prepare mate and drink it. And that was the closest we could get to a communal sort of ceremony. They also prepared coffee, um, wine, that was off. <laughs> but, um, but we were able to do that as best we could.
right. Thanks, everyone.